Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Rubin Museum of Art, a global hub for Himalayan art here in the heart of Chelsea. Uh, we sometimes call it the foothills of Chelsea, but um, we're going to do some climbing tonight. My name is Tim McHenry. I am Deputy Executive Director of the Rubin, and uh, really delighted that we can share in this mini-series, Life After with Amanda Palmer. Now, the inspiration for this show is another show, which is on the sixth floor, and it's called Death is Not the End. And it's about Tibetan and Christian approaches to the afterlife, because what do we know about what happens? And how do we prepare ourselves for what we don't know? Life after, the subject of our Spiral magazine and all our thematic programming this year. And so we thought it would be super fun to get one of the most fierce storytellers in the world, like Amanda Palmer, mm -hmm. to address the big things that happen to us that totally recalibrate the way we need to adapt and go forward. And the first topic tonight is one that all of us in this room have actually shared in. And it was this interregnum called COVID, lockdown. We were all there. What happens now? That's the question we're going to ask. And Amanda has curated this mini-series with three extraordinary thinkers and artists. <coughs> and the first artist tonight is Gonka Gyatso. And for those of you who are not familiar with his work, you will see some of his work projected on the screen uh, behind me. But let me just say that Gonka is one of the pioneering Tibetan artists who took this extraordinary sense of, oh, we are now a global entity. Globalization is taking force as, as a cultural way of being and lensed it through traditional Tibetan iconography and imagery, sort of mash up between pop and tradition. And he does it like no other, and he's a groundbreaker in this world. And, uh, <coughs> while he's been in an exhibition um, here at the Rubin, and of course in collections all around the world, including the Met, uh, he's never actually been on stage here. And so we're really delighted that he can join us uh, tonight with Amanda Palmer. Now, Amanda Palmer may need no introduction to you, but just know that Dresden Dolls and the Art of Asking are two extraordinary polarities of the many in her uh, extraordinary, remarkable talent set. And so we're going to start off with one of her great talents, which is the song of life after on the ukulele. Yeah. Amanda Palmer.
That was great. Thanks. <laughs> I tried. I tried and failed. It was almost like I did it on purpose. Um, hold on. I'm going to put this Brittany has on. Yeah. <laughs> that is for my conservatorship. Uh, is that on? I don't think so. Turn the mic on? Turn the pack on? Yeah. Hello. Now is it on? Um, the ukulele going out of tune while being played is the theme of our evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is sort of feels like what um, what life is like. So I'm Amanda, as you know. This is Gonkar. I want to go right in and let and show this one. This is Gonkar's work. Mm -hmm. This is called The Great Equalizer. And um, do we have a mic in the audience? Yeah? Will any brave soul in this audience raise their hand and, uh, and just in a word or two tell us how this looking at this makes you feel? If no one else does it, I know Meow is going to do it in the back. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. Bring the mic over. Uh, annoyed. Annoyed. <laughs> Great. That's on point. Yeah. Oh, uh, right over here. Thank you. Suffocated. <sighs> Suffocated. Over here. Tender. 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 Ooh. Over over here in the middle. We'll have to get the mic over Floating. to you. Floating. Um so I uh I actually thought this work would have ma been made a, a few years ago. This work was made this year. And um Oh, no, st can you stay on it? Or did that happen by accident? The hand of God switched to a different art. Um, you and I talked about this a little bit, but what I actually, what I wanted to ask you about was the color. Yeah. And what it means. Wait, hold on a second. Can we fix that <laughs> so we can stare at the art while we talk about it? It's floating. You did that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm annoyed you did that um, do you know why that's hap do you know why that's happening up there it just doesn't want it's a what oh it's on slideshow oh. ah, does anyone know how to fix that does anyone speak powerpoint because I don't I'm a musician um, Oh, so it's just gonna, it's gonna slowly carousel unless we take it out of slideshow mode. Hold on, I think I can fix that. Where it says use slideshow, I'm going to press it and see if that does anything. No. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, we have it up now. I don't have it here, but we don't need it here. Yeah. So go ahead and we'll see if we can fix that while we talk. Mm, so, oh, it's about the color. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, because during the during the pandemic in 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 China, uh, actually I'm based in Chengdu now, mm -hmm. and so I was there during the whole time. And uh, so there is a mm, system which is being developed. Uh, right from the beginning of pandemic and uh, uh, on kind of app so you have to download actually everyone has to download one in your in your mobile phone and uh, then that app uh, has uh, three different colors red yellow and green mm. and uh, then the green will tells you you are all good 
and also you are allowed to go out or go to uh, go to shopping or or go back to where you need to go. But when it's ten, when the color turning to yellow in your phone, then you have you then you are not allowed to go anywhere. You have to stay home. And uh, then for some instance, some people, if they got, got red, then, then you being been taken away to, to uh, how do you call it? The hospital. Not hospital. Or quarantine. It's quarantine, yes. Yeah. And uh, so that, that's become a kind of very dominant thing for past more than three years. And uh, then why why we had the title as a great equalizer. Somehow, mm, during that period, uh, no matter you are rich, poor, old or young, or you are high official or just normal person, I think somehow that three color treat you pretty equal. Mm. So that's, that's where the title is kind of, kind of came from, and uh, yeah. That's interesting. The first thing I thought is that the mask was the, e the equalizer. <laughs> that, you know, I mean, you could have a fancy mask, you could have a yeah. blinged out mask, but, it, it, you know, a mask is a mask. Actually, that makes sense. I haven't mm. thought about that. It's true, yes. I mean, especially in China, uh, the mask, is being with us for the whole time. Mm. Without masks, you can't really go out. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. Do you think we can fix this? Okay. Great. I think we're good to go. Um, so here we are. <laughs> um, so the the next slide we're going to look at is. It almost looks like a film when you go from one slide to the next because mm -hmm. it looks like these colors are just dissolving. But this is a different this is a different sculpture. And so, can you tell us what this means? This is no longer red, yellow, and green. Oh, it's here. Yeah, you can look at it down here too. Uh, actually, that should be the the one yellow. Yes. So can you explain, there's three, there's three sculptures here. Yeah. So, and the colors are all slightly different. This one is red, yeah. green on the bottom. Yeah. This one is green, pink on the bottom. So why, why, these, why these variations? What is it, what is it saying? Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean the one, the, the app I was mentioned actually, uh, probably uh, mainly, uh, you, I, I made it a face, which is representing those three colors. But uh, during the during the during the preparation, uh, especially this sculpture, we did a kind of uh, uh, it's called a kind of a neon coating, which is very kind of shining and uh, very kind of metal looking surface. Uh, but during the time, I was. Earlier, I was planning just make the face as the three colors, then the body would be just the same. Mm. But somehow, it does mm, the 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 effect doesn't look uh, not that great. Also, it's a little, little too harsh. Then somehow, I I want to make uh, uh, the whole sculpture. Uh, a more, I think somebody said, uh, more, uh, is that gentle or? Floating, gen tender. Tender. Yeah. That's, that's why I, I, I sort of, it would be nice to have a kind of s something little gentle or color underneath. And uh, so that's why uh, I did that. So I just want to make it more soft and also visually more appealing. Because um, during the during the proce process of making the sculpture, I got a feedback from collectors and also curator. They were saying, especially 
it was made this year, early this year, and then they were saying, I mean, the pandemic is over. Do you remember we have a conversation because people doesn't like the way you say post-pandemic? Mm. I, uh, I, I made a con around the time that we were titling this talk, I said something in some post on the internet about, uh, I, f I can't even remember exactly what it was, but it was something along the lines of, you know, after COVID or post COVID. And someone really took issue with that. And I thought it was a really valid point actually, you know, and also who was allowed to say after COVID, who was allowed to say that we are post COVID. Um, no one really. I mean, there is no giant arbiter in the sky who gets no. to say we're done with that, which is a lot of what this conversation is going to be about. Um, but yeah, I was even scared. I mean, I'm always scared that I'm going to get canceled. <laughs> so it happens every day. Um, uh, yeah, I was scared that, you know, life after COVID was going to just get like at least five or six people telling me that I should be canceled from the internet. Uh, we did the title anyway. So like, yay us. Uh, but yes, back to yeah. what you were saying. So that's also happened exactly when I was making the sculptures. People say, I mean, the pandemic's over. Mm -hmm. We don't want to mask Buddha anymore. Mm. But for me, I sort of, sure, it's over, but I want to leave something behind, you know, after, I mean, I was imagine maybe after 10 or 50 years when someone saw this sculpture of Buddha mm. in some way wearing a mask, then it might raise a question, say, why the Buddha wearing a mask? Mm. Then they might say, okay, yeah, actually 50 years ago, there's horrible things happening uh, with us. And uh, then of course, that's also one of the, one of the thinking behind them. Then also, I, uh, somehow I was kind of compromising um, using some of the color with uh, the bottom of the Buddha, try to make it more, you know, not too on your face. Mm. So visually more kind of gentle and uh, maybe a little beauty, I guess, yeah. I mean, it was interesting to hear this disparate reaction from the audience. I mm -hmm. mean, usually a statue of a Buddha is supposed to make you feel very peaceful, tender, like this very calm figure. And the idea that uh, it annoys you is interesting yeah. because of what it represents. Was the, is the mask on the sculpture a cloth mask, like an, like an average cloth mask, or is it kind of a more uh, durable material? Uh, you mean the material? Yeah, the, Actually the, that the a, actual mask is made of. It's, a, it's made of uh, uh, a fabric glass. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, then we we used exactly the same mask. Uh, it was very popular during that time. Then th even there is a number for that. I think it's called uh, N. The N95. That's mask. it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there is one moment we even couldn't hold off it because it's all sold out mm. or run out, and uh, so I thought that would be kind of the perfect. Uh, mask to to represent that period. Yeah, I want to show this one. This <laughs> I love this. Mm. This um, th this looks like a lot of your other artwork that where it's a lot busier and there's all this uh, all these pop references. Yes, and the mask. Yeah, so. We, uh, we got to have dinner together just now and, and talk about a bunch of stuff, that I, some of which we'll repeat because some of it was so interesting. But I asked you, because um, we started talking about these stickers, and um, I asked you if anyone got upset, which I assumed the answer would be yes, but also you never know, uh, you know, that this is this sacred 
iconography and you're not supposed to be putting pop culture stickers on it. But we didn't really get into, you said yes. We didn't really get into why. Why someone would be upset about this who, and who. Can you talk about that? Uh, I mean, kind of in a common sense, it does showing kind of disrespect. That's what I know too. And uh, uh, because sticker, uh, it's uh, also I think the sticker is kind of evolving. Uh, at the beginning, I think the sticker, as I told you before, it was more kind of commercial, uh, commercialized uh, kind of uh, tiny shining thing. Then also it, it looks so tacky and uh, then I, I remember actually the tacky, that's the first wor words I learned when I was in England, then tacky, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> then <laughs> then uh, later I realized actually tacky is not, not that great word because it's, <laughs> it means you are shallow, you are, you know, uh, kind of uh, all those associate and uh, so it does uh, raise raise the question, but I I, I was uh, mm, but my intention was uh, uh, not really try to uh, try to you know uh, to to uh, I don't know how do you say in English to, uh, not disrespect mm. for that icon. I was kind of just try to uh, make make the Buddha can really associate with our daily life. Mm. Because normally I think the Buddha, when you put it there, it's, uh, you always feel a little distance. Then also, you, when it's just Buddha, you, you always feel he should be up a little bit than your eye level. But when you put a sticker, then <laughs> suddenly it's come down <laughs> in your eye level. Then people will get even more closer to look say, Wow, there is something I used to play when I was a kid, and ah. there is something really uh, associated with uh, my culture, and uh, so that's really was the the the, the, the intention behind. And uh, also, I think uh, in early days, as a Tibetan artist uh, doing a contemporary art, and then went to England, and then also. Uh, I mean, inside, I really want to, there is kind of hunger to being included into this uh, London art scene. And, uh, but if you are just stick with the tradition, then somehow you, you might not, uh, you are not, uh, not included. Then you just become a, uh, somebody from Tibet and in the middle of the London still doing Tibetan things. But that's something I wasn't uh, going to do. I thought I should uh, really dive myself into into the, the the London art scene or even the life. And uh, so, so gradually, I mean, the the stickers become more more elaborate. I, I collecting a lot of stickers. Then gradually, also, I used a lot of paper cut. <laughs> from the magazines yeah. and the newspapers, and uh, also uh, putting a lot of uh, uh, different content, context, you know, uh, political, social. Uh, so yeah, uh, I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, kind of. Right. I mean, the question was about who gets angry. Oh. Mm, not on my face. But uh, <laughs> that, that's for sure, because that's a nice thing about uh, uh, the Tibetan uh, and also about the people uh, following the Buddhism. Normally, they, they are quite polite, so they won't <laughs> tell you in your face. <laughs> but on the behind, yes, you, you get, a, you get a criticized. And uh, uh, but still, I feel... We, we as a, as a Tibetan artist, we are pretty lucky. I mean, mm. nobody say going to come to cut your head off, you know. And uh, good. so, so <laughs> that's the good, probably the nice thing well, about it. Well, yeah, I mean, I wonder if you were going to, um, 
cover any particular religious icon with graffiti-like stickers, I, I wonder if the Buddha is the safest versus, say, a statue of Jesus. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe that's some kind of measure of, uh, you know, the, the belief system mm -hmm. itself. It reminds me of, uh, there was a book that I really loved. It was actually, like, it was, it was one of the two or three books that really drew me into and turned me on to Buddhism for life. I was in my early 20s. And um, it, it, it's a book called Dropping Ashes on the Buddha. Does anyone know this book? By Sung San. And the title of the book is, is a story taken from the book that Sung San, uh, these are all letters between him and his students and the American students. So he's a Korean monk teaching American students and writing all these letters back and forth with them. And it's a great book. And the, the story or the question that he asks is you're, you're sitting, uh, you know, you're meditating in a hall and someone comes in with a lit cigarette mm -hmm. and drops ashes on the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And what do you do? And this is sort of like, it's, it's a similar question. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's this question about, you know, what is, what's sacred. Yeah. And, and, and it was the thing that I liked about Buddhism. I just found myself thinking like, if this is a religion that can ask this question and kind of jovially, I think this belief system might be more for me uh, than Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Uh, where, you know, really the only answer is that's just not allowed and we're not even going to discuss it. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of, like, playfulness. But, you know, uh, there is a realization when I was in England, I mean, after a few years spending London, uh, spend time in London, uh, one of the things I really inspired by, by the Westerners, uh, how they treat the... the iconography of Buddha. Mm. Uh, somehow, I think, of course, there is a, there is a group of people that really adore him and also treat him as a, a, a deity, put it up uh, your eye level. But there is one group, also quite a big group of people, they treat it as a cultural object. As a what? Culture yeah. object. So that means, you know, then they, they, they will, then you will see them in the, you will see them in the sh uh, fashion store, you will see them in the massage place. I mean, even I saw some of them in uh, somebody's house in, uh, in the beautiful bathroom, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 true. I, I really came across uh, uh, one time when I was in London, went to one of the parties, and uh, uh, so somehow it, it does make me uh, I kind of, uh, that's also I think where my works came from. I, 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 I treat the Buddha more like uh, a culture mm. uh, elements rather than the religious element. And uh, then also, I think it does uh, open up the Buddha. I mean, like the, what, I, what I was telling, telling you during the dinner, I mean, when some of the monk, when they saw my work, then they say, wow, it, this is uh, something that they said, uh, actually, that's what a Buddha really should be, which is means, you know, more accommodating, more open-minded, mm. and can observe whatever comes comes to him that's what they told me and then that's that's what a uh, uh, kind of really the way I, I i treat this buddha figure and until now i mean even that one uh, uh, since i'm in china now then I started using a lot of the uh, images and the stickers basically collected in China mm. and uh, then try to reflect the, the, the kind of the grassroots culture scene in, in, in China. And uh, that's what I did probably 10, 15 years ago in London, then also later in New York. So now 
I'm doing the, exactly the kind of the similar thing in 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 China, and also uh, I think this is the first time I made uh, the sticker Buddha in China, and. Uh, 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 the the feedback is quite a mix. I mean, some people they loved it. Some people uh, they don't. Uh, but I just want to know what the monks think. Like uh, <laughs> actually, surprisingly, the the monks are pretty <laughs> pretty easygoing. <laughs> <you know? laughs> the monks are way better than the art critics. I uh, <laughs> yeah. No, for me the. For me, the most scaring one is uh, uh, when you met, uh, I mean, when I was in London, I met uh, uh, English people really into Buddhism. And in China, I also met Chinese are really into Buddhism. When they saw that work, then they were really get upset. Yes, really upset. What do you more, think? More than the Tibetans, so yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's pretty, yes. Yeah. This, is, this is a familiar feeling. Uh, I mean, as a, I don't know, there's been a lot of um, discussion around also cultural appropriation and who is allowed to de defile, you know, or, or graffiti or um, modify what. It, it would be interesting to know what y what you would think actually if the reaction to this work would be different if it were made by somebody British or somebody American mm -hmm. and not by somebody Tibetan like do you think as a Tibetan you get more of a pass making this kind of work mm. yes or no probably <laughs> yes or no <laughs> no because I <laughs> yeah okay no I <laughs> I did met some Western artists and also in nowadays in China, uh, people are meddling with the, the Buddhas, yes. Mm. And, uh, mm. But in general, I think as you mentioned, I mean, there is a couple of religious icons. I think Buddha seems the most safe one, I think, to play with. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, I want to get to what happened to both of us in, during, I don't want to say during COVID, I want to say fr from the beginning of COVID onward, <laughs> TBD, uh, and, and our artwork. But before we get to, uh, you know, February, March, 2020, you went to, uh, you left New York six years ago about, yeah. And you were going to go to back to Lhasa and you wound up in China. Yeah. And um, you wanted to talk about why. And I would love to know why. I'd, I'd love to hear this story. Mm, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was, uh, that was my, my, Actually, it was my dream, actually, uh, since 2004. Uh, 2004 was the first time I went back to, to China and to Tibet uh, when I got the British passport. And uh, then since then, I really, uh, that was kind of my, my wish. I want to go back to Lhasa and uh, set up studio and uh, working uh, and uh, living there, and uh, then, then I, then I, it took a long time to to get into that stage. Then, then of course, uh, also I spent a couple of years in New York. Then I met a, 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 a young lady, and uh, then we had a son. Uh, and the young lady was what nationality? Uh, she's American, yes, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, then, mm, also I think inside me, actually, I mean, uh, 92, I left Tibet, uh, went to India. And uh, then 
uh, kind of without, I mean, those days, I, I feel even I was early 30s, but somehow I think my, uh, my, my head, uh, I mean, I don't have much concept of nationalities or the boundary between the countries. And uh, then somehow, uh, after a couple of months or year in Dalam Sala, then suddenly I realized I'm become a refugee, you know, uh, mm. there. And uh, it took me a couple of years to realize, actually, mentally, I'm not very happy being a refugee or living in another country. Sure, maybe for some time, I mean, when I was young, I, I don't mind go out to India, go to England, come to New York to learn things and to see things. But uh, inside me, I still want to go back to, to, to my hometown. Mm. And uh, uh, so that's what, I, what we did. And I convinced my uh, ladies and my son, we went back to... Uh, I told them we can go back to Lhasa and uh, uh, my son can learn Tibetan and the Chinese and of course English then my lady can teach Tibetan English because she's, uh, she has a degree of education. Uh, but somehow when we got to Chengdu, we realized uh, actually you know, there is a policy in China the foreigners are not uh, allowed to uh, settle in Lhasa. Uh, so then we end up, uh, we end up living, end up in Chengdu uh, since then. Yeah. And who was considered a foreigner? Actually, all of us, all three of us, because I'm British, then my son and uh, I, my son's mother, they are Americans. And uh, even though I, we, I, I had some uh, relationship or guanxi, which is connection when I was in there. I mean, I really try to use those channels, try to make us to go move to Lhasa, but it never succeed. Mm. And uh, so I, I end up, end up in Chengdu, yeah. So it's very, uh, it's very different, but I had uh, a like a, a strange cousin of that happen during uh, the early part of the pandemic. Um, and uh, I wanted to swap. We saved this for the stage. We didn't talk about this really m that much before this talk, even though we've spoken several times. Um, I wanted to swap 2020, 2021 into 22 stories with you. Uh, and, and then also talk about what, what happened to us as artists. I think it's so interesting that we're sitting here as two very different kinds of artists. Like obviously people from different cultures, different places, but I'm a songwriter, a musician, uh, sometimes like a very literal memoirist and stuff and then and then there's this. Um, but I think, I don't know a single artist of any medium that wasn't mangled one way or another by this experience. A and maybe mangled into a better shape, but like m mangled doesn't maybe necessarily need to be negative, but mangled. Um, and um, my, uh, my COVID experience was being on tour. I had been on tour already away from my home country. Um, I was born in New York, raised in Boston, and uh, was at the time married to a British person. Um, and I had been on the road since about August 2020, and I was finishing up a world tour in March 2020, and I was doing my four final shows of the tour in New Zealand. And uh, that's when the shit hit the fan. And you all probably remember those f middle few weeks of March 2020. And um, my 
husband at the time was in Melbourne, Australia with my kid. We have kids almost exactly the same age. <laughs> we both have now eight-year-old sons. Mine is nine. Yeah. Yours is nine. One year old. <laughs> One year older. <laughs> yeah. And mine, mine is eight. So around this time, our kids would have been five, six. Yeah. So my son Ash was five. They were in Melbourne waiting for me to knock off these last four New Zealand shows. And we made this fast decision, like New Zealand was about to go into lockdown. We found out on almost no, no notice and it was either stay in New Zealand, maybe go back to Australia or maybe just get on a flight right now and come home to New York. And we had a quick phone call because my husband was over in Melbourne. And I said, you know, New Zealand's really nice. It, it, we're going to be stuck somewhere for a week or two. <laughs> Let, just come over to New Zealand. We'll go get an Airbnb near my friend's house and we'll just ride this whole thing out. It might even be three weeks. So let's just go to the countryside in New Zealand. If we go to Australia, you know, we'll probably just wind up in the city and... And then, um, that was around March 20th. And uh, my husband and my son came over. We went into an Airbnb. We locked down. New Zealand had a very, very, very strict lockdown, more similar to um, China, I think, than, than part, most parts of America. And, um, and then my marriage fell apart in that Airbnb for reasons unrelated to COVID. And, uh, and my co-parent left, but we all just thought that this would be a week or two, that we would all see each other back in New York and then we'd get divorced like normal people. <laughs> and, uh, and instead, I wound up staying in New Zealand for two and a half years. Wow. <laughs> two and a half years. And almost a year of it without uh, my kid's dad. And, and the thing that I find myself thinking when I listen to you is um, it would be absolutely inappropriate of me to call myself any kind of refugee, although it was often a joke among the, you know, the sort of accidental expats in New Zealand who were just staying there by choice. No one was stuck there. You know, at a certain point, once the big lockdown was over, anyone could get onto a plane at any point, I could have gotten onto a plane and flown back to New York, but the gates shut behind you. And, um, and, and I really found myself uh, seeing my country from a totally bizarre perspective, really for the first time in my life. Even though I had traveled around and been like a wayfarer and a journeyman and a wanderer and a touring musician and a, all of that, it, it was quite something to look at my people, my country, and the situation there from so far away mm -hmm. for so long. And, and to not really even, to look at my child and go like, you don't even really know what that is. You've, he kind of wound up growing up in New Zealand. And um, when I hear you tell the story, I mostly wonder what it felt like for you that you that your own your own self you from this place that you were considered a foreigner you know not just your american lady mm -hmm. but that that you know because you'd swapped out passports you're no longer welcome in your own home uh actually i'm kind of mm, get used to it now uh, because uh, since 92 I, I left I left uh, Lhasa went to India uh, then I really started the whole journey for more than 15 years and uh, uh, I mean even when I was in India I I, I don't uh, even though I, I was among the Tibetan in Dharamsala, but somehow you still feel you are outside. Mm. And uh, then it's exactly the hap same thing happened when I was in England. And 
then of course uh, came to New York, then went back to went back to uh, China, and uh, then occasionally, of course, I can I can still go go back to Lhasa for a short period, mm -hmm. and uh, then you still had the same same same. I still feel the same, and uh, then then I'm not exaggerating. It's it's exactly really happened. I mean, even in Lhasa. Uh, I have a lot of uh, friends, which is we grow up uh, from 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 when when we are little, and also I have a lot of artist friends. We we did a lot of things together in the early eighties and the nineties. Uh, nowadays, I mean, when I met them, sure we 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 can have a laugh and we can have a, a kind of uh, kind of the the the. The relationship is uh, doesn't go deep anymore. It's uh, uh, especially I feel uh, uh, I feel they don't really trust me. To I mean, we used to go in the eighties and the nineties when we used to really burning a candle. Do you say burning candle? I mean, talk about politics or everything. Uh, it's not happening anymore, and uh, so somehow I feel the relationship between me and my f my friends or childhood friends become a kind of pretty uh, on the surface. You know, there is there is no deep conversation. Then, uh, then now I'm in Chengdu, and then of course it's uh, I feel even more kind of outsider because I'm not a native Chinese even though my Chinese are pretty good and uh, uh, so it's it's uh, it's what it is I think uh, <laughs> there's nothing I can really change I mean I tried but uh, uh, yeah you so that's that's going to be probably going to with me until when I end up my life, I think it's I'm I'm always going to be an outsider. Yeah. Where does your son feel like he belongs? My son? Yeah. Does he feel does he feel really at home somewhere? Uh I think he's he's a <laughs> he's pretty so home at America. I mean he's very become a very American little boy this time I mean after three years because we also being separated us what uh, happened to you and uh, so I saw him just a month ago and uh, after three years and uh, he he seems pretty happy and in, in, in here yes and uh, what else I suddenly come up something I forgot maybe well, if it's up. not to, uh, I mean, you can get as personal as you want. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you spent COVID? And maybe also, I mean, you said you were separated from your son, so I assume that your marriage ended before yeah. COVID. Can you talk about what happened? I mean, as much as you want about the marriage ending, mm -hmm. whatever, but also w where you were, how it felt. What happened? Uh, no, it was a it was a little disaster. I mean, whole whole <laughs> whole whole plan to go back to Lhasa. I mean, Lhasa we didn't get in. Then we end up in Chengdu. And, and what this was this six was, years ago. Yes, and uh, then that time Chengdu's pollution was really bad. Then somehow my my son was very allergic to the air. Mm. Then just after one year, then he get really sick. At the beginning, we didn't know what's happening. Then after a few weeks or months struggle, then the, then the doctor, because also, you know, in China those days, uh, the pollution has become also a very political issue. Uh, mm. Nobody going to publicly say because it's a pollution. Mm. So it took us a little struggle. Then the doctor say, 
Literally, he was saying, why don't you take your son to the seaside? <laughs> That's it, yes. Then we took, then we take a turn to take him to, to the Chinese uh, seaside. Then it does mm. make him better, yes. Then we realize, yes, it's the air. And uh, then, then, I mean, when, as a mother, probably you might, uh, has the experience when your son gets sick by the environment, then the mother get really hate this place. Then in the end, we we have to re re uh, relocate them to to Thailand to Phuket, mm. and uh, so that's really the kind of the separation started. And uh, so there is a yeah. Uh, so uh, when when you have a uh, you got. Uh, your son's sick, then also I couldn't go back to Lhasa, and also my, uh, I mean, I I came to China, then also I have to try to reestablish, I mean, I was kind of starting s the scratch, which is I did a couple of times in my life. Uh, you have to build up a relationship for your, for your, for your artwork and for your connection. Then all those makes me pretty uh, stressed. Then I guess probably I was uh, not very nice to, to my ladies, and then she got really hurt, and uh, so there is kind of crack started. But I, I I got a feeling. I mean, if if not the pandemic, up to three years separation, we might able to talk through, or you know, can work something out. But. Uh, after three years separation, then that really went. Mm. So yeah. you stayed in Chengdu? Uh, no, I was, uh, because my work at studio is in Chengdu, so uh, there is there is uh, about a year and two, I was flying over between Phuket and Chengdu for frequently. Then just before the pandemic, uh, they went back to uh, New York, New Jersey to for the for the Christmas. Mm. Then after Christmas, then the country shut down. Then I was in Thailand. I was <laughs> I was locked down in Thailand. I couldn't go back to to Chengdu. So it was a uh, it was pretty pretty horrendous. So and, uh, how long did you go without seeing your son? Uh, three, three, three years. Oh. yes, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So it was uh, the whole, whole, whole go back home plan end up, uh, yes, pretty disaster. <laughs> yeah, that's a disaster. Yeah. Um, so, w I mean, while you were thinking, you're spending all this time, you're, you're thinking up art, and you're, you're thinking up ideas, was... Was any of that at work in there? What was going on with your marriage, with your son? Oh. Were you just thinking about COVID? And I mean, hearing that story, I kind of look at these images differently. I'm looking at this one right now. I want to show mm -hmm. it. I want to change images. This one's really beautiful. Get it? Um, I, I don't know if there's a good way of asking this question, but um, I if you had to try and summarize how that that experience, you know, not even just because I don't think anyone can separate COVID from what the, the conditions that arose around COVID. You know, it isn't really so much about a virus and just the masks or just the lockdown. It was also the massive ripple effect of what happened socially, relationally, economically, politically. Uh, I mean, so it, it- Mentally. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was everything, everything all at once, sort of like, I mean, I, I think of it like a, like a train hitting a, hitting a wall and then just like everything, you know, everything slides off the table, but also like the train machinery is also <laughs> compromised. And, um, 
what happened to you? What, what changed? Uh, I think mm, I've become much calmer, definitely, for sure. And also uh, uh, much more, uh, I mean, probably, I mean, as a as an artist, also, I mean, uh, you always have a kind of this uh, drive. You want to be the best, or you want to be the you know the uh, the best seller, or whatever. Uh, that perspective changed. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, especially uh, just. When I'm when I'm family having the, all those troubles and uh, I couldn't do work, be honest, and uh, then I drop all the project for 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 commission or galleries or exhibition. I just went back to do some small drawings. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have the picture, but we have a catalog uh, mm. somewhere. Uh, then also that. Oh, the drawing was showing in Denver, uh, Denver University at the moment. So that's what I started. I was a, uh, uh, I sort of, it would be, uh, not I saw it, it was a kind of, uh, uh, kind of wish, just want to be quiet and then do something tiny, drawing, maybe day or two other days, you know, just, uh, more kind of entertaining, mm, not entertaining. I think more more like uh, uh, do you call therapy? Yes, it's a, it's almost like doing a calligraphy. Mm. But uh, in my uh, circumstances, I was just doing some drawings, what whatever, whatever comes out in my mind, and uh, uh, so it, it was a kind of this this uh, little project. It's mm, uh, started, I think it was 2018 round, and uh, then it was keep continue until now. Especially those drawing during the pandemic was so. I think somehow those drawing really saved me, mm. because in Chengdu I was pretty miserable because uh, my family, all my family is in Lhasa, and then uh, I don't have a wife, I don't have a son there in America. Then I was the one who only end up in Chengdu, and uh, uh, then of course you, <laughs> you guys know. I mean, in China, the restriction was so severe. I mm. mean, we've been locking down pretty frequently. Uh, so you end up really. Uh, I mean, I know, uh, I know a lot of people in, in Chengdu, uh, my friends or friends' friends. They had a really hard time. I mean, a lot of people really went pretty extreme during that period, and uh, then somehow I think for me I was I was kind of lucky. At, at least I have a little project um, drawing I was doing pretty much every day. But especially when you lock down, you can't go out in your room. Then you you do need something to entertain yourself. I mean, there is no creativity involved. It's almost like uh, you just use something to take your mind off, and uh, that's that's what I I did for during that period. And those work actually. It's a I had the idea, but couldn't quite uh, do it. So those are the basically I did almost like uh, this 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 year after the after the pandemic end and. Uh, yeah, so I guess probably it's the same thing happen when you to you. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I have a lo I have some similar stories about what happened to to my um, you know my artist brain during those times. In a way, I had a you know I had a flip side of what you had because I wound up I was the one who wound up with the child separated. Yeah from the other parent and with no warning really just like uh and 
So you become a full-time mother. Yeah. A and also after, you know, uh, not very proud to admit it, but also uh, it's, it feels easier to talk about in retrospect. When my kid was young, like a baby and a toddler, um, I, took, I took four to six months off right after he was born. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't have a planned time to go back to work, but I was really hungry to go back to, you know, that way of thinking that you referenced where it was just like, I need to get back to being successful. I need to get back to being important. I need to get back to like climbing the fame ladder and making sure people know about me and know about my band and I'm gonna publish another book and I'm gonna put out a new album. And like, I, I, I never really ditched the idea of like forward and upward motion. Mm. You know, my, my, my career ego ambition. Uh, I was just gonna be amazing and do it with a baby. <laughs> Cause I'm amazing. Uh, and, and I, you know, I had a partner who also just barreled on in his career and we got a nanny and sometimes two nannies and we just went for it and traveled constantly and booked all of the gigs and, and uh, you know, and we're out there, I think, feeling like we were crushing it, but also uh, it, it wasn't very tender it wasn't slow, and it was quite punishing. Yeah. And I didn't really feel the, the immensity of how fast I had been going, how fast we had both been going until like, we, we hit that wall. And I just, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, it, it also felt pretty awful to not have a choice and then realize it and go like, oh my God, only faced with no choice <laughs> am I going to choose to like dive into the actual real job of being a mother and not delegate it to someone else. It was pretty embarrassing. Um, but it, it definitely, like it knocked me on my ass. And, um, you know, and the part of me that was an artist was mostly just dealing with the anger at my partner. Like all of the songs that arose for a number of years and continue to this day <laughs> to arise are, are mostly, you know, they're not about COVID or that particular lockdown or survival. They're mostly just about that. And um, I, you know, I've been struggling as a songwriter since I was, 15 between like this is the song that showed up but do I actually write it or does that make me immature or is it this great cathartic thing that's going to change all of your lives when I bang it out on a piano and I still don't have the answer that's a yes and no till eternity I just don't even know I, and I'm dealing with that right now with the material that I've that I've written and have been writing. But I, I felt a similar thing, which is I, 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 I kind of got comfortable with giving up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the art that I wound up making during those years, in the small amount of time that I had to make art here and there, because mostly I, I didn't have a ton of time, um, d didn't feel to me like anything that I was trying to do to be impressive or or good at it. It was mostly just survival art, survival songs, so songs that were so cathartic that they felt good to play and it, I didn't even really care if they were good songs. I'm not sure if you cared if they were good drawings, mm -hmm. but it, it didn't matter if they were good. Yeah. It just mattered that I had made something and it, it was almost like a get it off me sort of, uh, feeling. I, I also had patronage, which really saved me. Because if I hadn't had a Patreon uh, that I, for which I had to supply at least one piece of art a month, I wouldn't have had to make anything. Because, uh, you know, this was how I was paying my bills. So I had to come up with something mm -hmm. every month. And for a while I came up with podcasts, but that kind of, I was like, I'm a musician. 
I'm not, I can only get away with that for so long. And um, I was like, you know, if I, f if I finish this song, even if it's just an okay song, I can, I can put it out and I can get paid. Um, and there was also a kind of a, there was almost a self-respect in that too. Like it doesn't even matter if the art is good, but I'm still a working artist. I'm not just a surviving mother in a pandemic. I made something. Mm -hmm. and, and I have a feeling, you know, there is this thing about making the drawing where you're like, it just, um, just to make something uh, when you're really caught in the catastrophe mm -hmm. uh, balances things out. And um, I think in, in those moments, I, I also reassessed, you know, how I valued myself as just a person who, who made any kind of art. Because my my ambition wasn't as big a part of it as just the, I just need to make something so, so that I can feel okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I had exactly the same, same, same experience because during the pandemic, I mean, a collector friend of mine, he's been supporting me for many, many years. So, Yes, I, he, he will commission me every couple of months a piece, then that's also, I, I, I made my living during that period, yes, because, I mean, the drawing, uh, I was, at the beginning, I was, I wasn't even thinking to show, you know, it's just kind of something I was doing as a fun, uh, you know. So interesting, a lot of similarities. Yeah, yeah. lots of similarities <laughs> and very different kinds of patronage. Yeah. But I mean, there is a thing about patronage that doesn't get a, as much discussion as I think it should, which is like, it's, it's still a motivator. There's all kinds of marketplaces and ways of exchanging art and money. Um, but just because you have a patron or patrons, um, and I think I think a lot of that kind of exchange still gets misunderstood nowadays, and and um, how authentic or, or genuine art coming out of a patronage system is and can be. That's that that's something I could talk to you about for hours. <laughs> but we have to start um, Q and Aing, or we're going to run out of time. So Tim Tim's going to come up and help with the Q and A. We really only have about oh, 10 minutes or so to um, uh, cultivate some questions and, and, and um, the, the questions, if they are such, should be directed to the two of them, if you don't mind, and, and maybe we have some ground rules to play with, but brevity <laughs> certainly amongst them, given the time that we've got. I think the best ground rule for the Q&A is if you can Google it, don't ask us. Yeah. Like, <laughs> take yeah. advantage of this right. live space and ask us something that you cannot Google. Ryan, we've got a hand up right in the middle of the house, and we've got a hand up right in the front row. Jay, if we can get the mic over here. Thanks. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for that vulnerable talk. It was very nice to be present with you. And I have a question, and this is a question for artists, but I think you both can find something to say about this. Um, I feel re very related to your story and feelings about foreigners. I'm immigrant and I first I stuck in Asia and it was beautiful. Then now I live in America and it's challenging. And mm. I always for many years already feel that foreigners. And this is help me um, try to find the way for connection with myself that I can give myself that rudeness, mm. that, you know, motherhood anywhere, doesn't matter who is around me, what country it is, and what I experience. And I have a question for you, how that foreignness open up some kind of awareness about yourself? Mm. Thank you. Thank That's you a so great much. question. Do you, 
to your thoughts? Uh, I didn't well, quite I get think, it. I think the, the summary of that question would be, has, has being a constant foreigner mm -hmm. given you a deeper, deeper connection to yourself? Maybe that's the best way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. I, I guess so, yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh yeah, I, I think absolutely, yes. I totally agree. Because uh, when, when, you <laughs> when everywhere you go, when you feel you are not fail, you're being treated outsider, then, then basically you can't have any deeper connection with the people around you. And uh, then you end up uh, talk to yourself more and look your, look into yourself. So definitely, yes, yeah. Um, I I I think that a, a, my answer to that question gets more and more complicated as time goes by. Um, the strangest thing that has happened to me is that I. You know, I wound up in New Zealand, which is a, an interesting kind of foreign country to be in as an American because it is very, you know, it's very British, it's very Western. It, it wasn't the same as if I had wound up in Lhasa or Phuket or something. Um, I spoke the language, uh, but I felt incredibly foreign. And then I also found myself thinking, wait a second, I feel almost as foreign in Havelock North, New Zealand, as I did in certain ways in Woodstock, New York. Mm -hmm. I started thinking that actually I felt like a foreigner in small towns and could only ever feel at home in a city. And that this sort of like, and that the boundaries weren't what I thought they were necessarily. And that I felt at home with certain people but really not with others. And, um, and when I returned home to America, I felt more homesick than I did when I was over in New Zealand. I think also because America just existed as an idea in my mind over in New Zealand and probably a kind of an ideal idea. And I, I also will never be able to tangle it out because I came back from New Zealand to a changed country, no doubt. And I sort of like skated around, really confused for a few months after I got home, just going, is it me? Was it COVID? Is it because I'm now a mother of a seven-year-old and not a three-year-old? Is it being in Woodstock, New York, which is just turned into a totally different kind of place because it's now all Airbnbs? Is it? <laughs> Is it what New Zealand did to me? And, and, like, and just going like, I, I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. And, and it was that kind of unknowing, that kind of confusion that, uh, that I think is, if it's helped me, when it helps me, root down and go like, it's just you, and it's just you, babe. It's just you. And, like, and the kid. You're going to have to be okay, wherever you are. And also, you know, maybe ditch this teenage idea that you're going to find your fucking people when you get to the right place. <laughs> you know, because it's not just going to happen because you get a loft in Soho in New York City. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And I actually did that when I was working on my book. I was like, I finally have the dough. I'm going to get an apartment in Soho. And I wandered around the neighborhood and I was like, what the hell? Like, where are the artists? What? Why is it just handbags? So, like, <laughs> I get the feeling it's a moving target. And I think when you, when you can accept that, you know, we are just going to be in the situation that we're going to be in, then it's like, well, then it's your community. It's who you choose to be around. It's where you choose to spend your time in the circumstances that you land in. And that, you know, that is a certain kind of strength. You know, what I found myself thinking in New Zealand is like, I can, if I can deal with this, I can probably just deal wherever. I'll find somebody, I'll find something. 
to give my life meaning. I'll find something to make me feel safe, whether it comes from in here or I find a bench that I like in the park. And I think, you know, a lot of human beings have had a, a lot harder time than I have just being stuck in the pandemic in New Zealand, um, trying to find... God, I want to actually just, like, Tim's going to kill me, but I want to read you something really short. My sister, I called my sister from the train down to the city today, and my sister was on a train in Amsterdam. I actually told, uh, I, I told this story earlier, but uh, she wound up, the train was stopped because the train had hit an entire family of people. And the whole train knew what was going on, and they all knew that they were going to be stuck in this train for three or four hours because it was a massive tragedy and catastrophe. My sister said, actually, everyone on the train is being okay. It's been a great study of human nature and how quickly people resign themselves to calm in an uncontrollable situation. And, like, there's, you know there's sort of the micro to the macro, like you just deal. Everyone in that train just had to kind of find their mm. calm spot. Yeah. So. You can train yourself to do that more often. Mm -hmm. So um, just to your question about how do we know who we really are and how do we find out who we really are? Uh, so we've got, um, we've been doing this for a few sessions now this year, at dark retreat workshops, which is the removal of all external light source. And it's, uh, a long-standing tantric tradition, uh, but we do a toe dip, you know, we don't do the 49-day one. <laughs> Although a man is dying to do a marathon of some other nature here, but, uh, but no, we were, well, we were in the dark for 90 minutes last time, which was a little excessive, but, but maybe 40 minutes or so. And of course, you start seeing the wonder of the unfathomable nature of everything there is because there are no boundaries. Mm. And you're with people who are in the same situation, maybe on the train, but this is a chosen um, point, but there's no point of reference other than yourself. Mm. That is what you're going to see as the lights go down. And it is fascinating, and we've got a really good guide. So the last one this year is on the 18th of um, this month. So please join in. You've got a question, hello. Yes. Yeah, just hold, hold it yep. close to your face. Objective otherwise. Oh, hello. This is for Amanda. Um, so when we started learning about singing being one of the most dangerous things that you could possibly do during the pandemic, um, did you ever have like a realization that, uh-oh, my career might not work anymore, um, <laughs> given the fact that like Broadway closed down, karaoke was basically illegal? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can you just speak to like, how, how you felt when you realized that that was actually one of the most dangerous things that you could do? That what was one of the most dangerous singing. things you could do? Singing. Oh, just sing singing, singing yeah. live, singing live in front of the people. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that question could probably go to Gonkar too. I mean, artists couldn't exhibit. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was a lot off the table all of a sudden. And I mean, I could do a... I could do a week-long seminar with different artists from sculptors to dancers to singers about what we had to surrender and withstand. Um, I was never worried about myself. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I worked on a certain kind of faith that this too shall pass. And I had the safety net of, you know, anywhere between 10 and 15,000 patrons. <laughs> All, I mean, if I was worried, I was worried at the very beginning. I remember typing out the blogs saying, I am fucked. <laughs> and I'm going to just be honest. I am not going to have time to blog and write songs about how sad lockdown is. Like, I'm, I'm stuck with a child in a foreign country, and I'm not gonna have any time to create. And if you leave as my patrons, I won't have an income, but I understand if you need to go. And almost no one left, which 
was unbelievable. I mean, gradually things kind of tapered off, especially as, as people had to tighten their own belts. But mostly, my patrons got it. They were like, no, 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 no. This is it. This is why we're here. We don't just want this to be this transactional thing where you're a song factory and we give you our $5. Like, we care about you and your kid. So what do you need? And I was like, that's quite amazing. Like, you're really going to do this. You're really going to just help me while I live in New Zealand and can't do anything. And most people were like, yeah, that's, this is the thing. Um, you know, I'm very lucky in that way. I've spent 10 years building a community where we've had enough conversations where that conversation, where that conversation could happen pretty spontaneously. That's not all artists, right? Um, but once that answer came, I did not worry. I mean, I did worry, like, how many years can one artist be like, I'm fucked? <laughs> but, you know, the answer in my case was quite a few years. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, Kankar, and, the, and the, the faith that you had that, like, things would return to normal, that your patrons would be patient, that the art world would still be there when you got back to receive your work. I mean, did you ever have a moment of, oh my God, I'm, this is all gonna fall apart? Mm. F funny enough, actually, I never really worried. Uh, no, somehow, uh, I think in the East, we, we have uh, this saying, uh, when, you, when you have a kind of skill for instance, if you are, uh, do you say barber? A barber. Yes, yeah. if you are a barber or if you are the, a chef, I mean, you go anywhere, you can get a job, you can survive. Then I think it's probably the same for the artist, I mean, especially the painter. I mean, the worst case, I can just go, go to paint the furniture, mm. you know, paint somebody's house or doors. Yeah. I can mm -hmm. still survive because I'm, I have this amazing hand. I can do amazing drawings. And uh, so, yeah, that somehow that really give you kind of, uh, it's kind of the basic instinct, I think. Yeah. 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 I think there's a, there's a part two to that answer, which mm -hmm. is like, I feel like musicians are one level less safe than people like painters who have slightly more practical skills. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. uh, but you know, there is also that low burn fear mm -hmm. that if it all hits the fan and, and things get very, very, very scary and very practical, we're the first to go. <laughs> 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 maybe, or maybe society shows up and really is like, no, what we really need now <laughs> is the artists. Um, but, you know, those are things I think you could drive yourself crazy no. thinking no, about. No, also, sorry, uh, I have to tell you something funny thing. Uh, during the pandemic, I mean, when everybody, everybody locked in the house, then somehow the online shopping goes kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yes, especially in China, uh, people collecting shoes, you know, the <laughs> brand then then i have a people even bring the shoes to me say can you do some drawing uh -huh. on them then they can resell it as a art piece yeah so you know when that sort of things happen then you just say oh <sighs> it, <laughs> yes it's like it's, your yeah you end up painting i mean drawing the shoes yeah. and decorate the shoes that's then you like can get that's it. like the equivalent of me that's it so gone yeah. going to be upstairs um shortly shoe painting he'll be signing your shoes if you like <laughs> yeah <laughs> he'll be signing copies of um this catalog which is uh the collection of all the sketches and drawings that he made over the period of lockdown and beyond um it's a treasure house of fascinating insights and Quizzical, humorous observations, um, and and uh, we urge you to partake. But um, what happens, uh, Amanda? Life after an Amanda Palmer program. 
What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Give us some advice. We're going to party on, Wayne. Uh, uh, are we, are we, uh, yeah, we're out of time? Yeah, because we've, we've, we've got a, yeah, I do have a train to catch. We've gone a little over time. Well, I mean, I think we're going to schmooze a little bit, and there's drinks, which is great, and it's Friday night. It is. Um, and uh, we're going to be back here next week doing this same sort of salon style conversation with an incredible thinker, writer named Sophie Strand. And if you don't know Sophie's work, uh, Sophie is one of those rare human beings where I'm like, you, you don't wanna miss this because you wanna catch her on the way up. Her, her intellect is unbelievable, outsized, and she's one of the most bizarre and articulate human beings that I've ever gotten the pleasure to converse with. It's gonna be really special. That's next week, and then the week after, we'll be back with Noor Tagori, who's an incredible journalist, and both just like firecrackers. So I will, I will, I will plug and talk your ears off as we drink wine about why you should come back next week and tell people about it. Um, but uh, I would like to take a moment to just thank you for having us and for to this space for existing. It's such a special, this whole place, this museum, it's such a special entity. And you've been wonderful to us, so thank you for having all of us here in this little living room. You've been our guides, and that's what artists do, right? <laughs> museum of art for a reason and artists very often sign point and show us truths that we are not even aware of and we need that in our lives and maybe that's the the little teaching that you can take out with yourself into the world that life after art would not be life at all so with that um, thank you so much for coming Amanda Palmer, thank you so much for putting this series together and holding the space. Thank you. And don't let the answer. Can I? Um... Danka is going to be upstairs by the shop. Um, and if you'd like to carry on the conversation with him, I know he'd like to have the conversation with you. Danka, thank you so much for gracing our stage. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. And if you have questions, for either of us, please buy Gonkar's book and see some of you next week or the week after. We'll all be upstairs. Thank you so much. Thank you.